event driven architecture with Azure SQL, .NET, and Azure Functions. So 30 minutes of fun because we'll be discussing about how to implement the event-driven architectures uh, with something we just released recently uh, that uh, will help you to build that around Azure SQL. So for those who are new, event-driven architectures is just basically an architectural pattern that allows you to uh, create a microservices solution that exchange events between each other. So the idea is that every microservice or every service is decoupled and autonomous and independent, can scale independently, can do its own thing, uh, but when it needs Another service do something, it will send an event <clears throat> and the other service will react to that event. So this is very uh, common and popular architecture. So one thing that is very uh, key to understand how all the events moves around and why they are needed is basically the, uh, the, the entirety of events, which is basically something that represents a change in a state or some update to a state. And the uh, event producer are those services who generates the event or and publish the event. And of course, typically in a complex uh, scenarios, you have an event router that uh, routes the event uh, to the right uh, consumer, which, be, which can be more than one. And then of course the consumer is those who get the event and decide what to do with it. For example, <clears throat> it could be in, you know, uh, a very simple example could be a signaler function that update uh, a website, for example. In this way, the service remain decoupled. Uh, they, as I said before, they are completely independent. Uh, and in general, it's easier to uh, just make sure that a solution that grows as your needs or your uh, requirements grows. So one of the most, well, I wouldn't say maybe the one of the most common, definitely one of the, uh, the, the feature in the service I like more is Azure Functions. Azure, Azure Functions is an event-driven serverless compute platform. Serverless means that you don't have to worry about infrastructure. So you just write your uh, uh, code and uh, deploy it, and then everything else is taken care of for you. <clears throat> it supports any language, of course, we'll be focusing on .NET. And uh, uh, another thing I really like is that uh, it has full support for on-premises development. So today we will be building something completely on-premises, and then I'll show you how uh, easy it can be deployed to Azure. Uh, and uh, one way to have this function executed, because again, you just deploy your code, but uh, the code isn't executed until something happens. Uh, that something is called a trigger, and a trigger is basically a way that you can use to cause a function to run. Uh, there are many triggers in Azure Functions supported. Uh, probably one of the most common one is a HTTP trigger that allows you to answer to HTTP request, basically creating a REST endpoint with Azure Functions. Uh, but there are many more. For example, you can uh, monitor for uh, uh, data change in a uh, Azure blob uh, or some event coming in into Event App if you're already using uh, event-driven programming. Um, so there's there's a bunch of them that you want to use. Uh, now would be fantastic if an Azure function could be executed when some data is changed in the target database, because that would enable the database itself to become itself an event producer, which means you don't have to pull for data in the database, but basically just react to change, which is exactly the whole uh, idea behind the event-driven programming. So you can react as fast as possible to change and then, you know, make something happen, like uh, make an order, uh, ship, uh, ship an order, or uh, 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 enable some some feature in a, in a, in a website, um, something like that. So that, that would be our dream, right? And now the, the main issue with that is how we can detect uh, changes efficiently in database, because maybe you have a million or, or a billion of rows, right? So how you can detect changes efficiently in the database and in general, even after you have detected the changes, how you can notify that function so that it can actually that can actually be executed. So that, that that is exactly why we have built in Azure SQL already from 2016. So it's available in Azure SQL, but all SQL Server edition from 2016, something called change tracking. Change tracking is a native lightweight solution that allows you to easily monitor a table to understand if some rows has changed. And, uh, and if, uh, if some rows has changed, you can get the information on what are the primary keys of the rows that has changed, so you can go back to the table and then get the latest uh, data for that specific row. Um, now, change tracking just needs to be enabled. It's part of the engine, so it doesn't come with additional cost, doesn't uh, have some any additional requirements, it's just uh, within the Azure SQL engine. And on top of 
change tracking, we lately released something called Azure Function SQL Trigger, which despite the name is not a trigger in the database sense, so it doesn't really use database trigger, is a trigger in the Azure function sense of things uh, because it is able to execute a function when some change is detected uh, on uh, the target table. Um, so Azure function SQL trigger is actually an Azure function feature that used behind the scene for you so you don't have to actually worry about that. Uh, this this uh, ability that Azure SQL and SQL Server has to detect changes using the change tracking uh, engine capability. So when uh, when a change is detected, an Azure function is executed. And uh, there are, of course, um, some details that you need to know. Uh, for example, what happens if you have multiple changes? Uh, so let's say, and I will show this in a demo very uh, very soon, but basically, if you have uh, a sequence of changes that uh, are happened together, for example, someone inserted a row and then immediately updated that row, and maybe, maybe did several updates to the same row, what you will be receiving in the Azure function is what we call the net change. So it's the sum of the insert plus all the subsequent update, which means basically you will access the latest version of the row. You will not be able to access the intermediate changes. Uh, this is of course done for uh, performance reason, but also because uh, on average, uh, uh, unless you are doing some ATL or some other more advanced uh, scenarios uh, with events, you probably need only the latest version of the data that is in your database, not all the intermediate one. Um, changes are sent in batches, so if there are 100 rows changes, they are sent uh, all together, so you will receive one payload with 100, um, with 100 rows, so your function will be executed once, but it will be able to act on 100 rows. <clears throat> And uh, let's say if you have many changes happen, let's say you have a million rows changed, of course, maybe an Azure function alone cannot handle all the workload. So auto optionally, you can, of because of course, that will come with a, some additional cost if you use more than one function at the same time, but you can actually enable automatic scale out so that if you have a lot of changes that need to be uh, processed, uh, you don't only have to use one function, but you can use as many as needed in order to keep up uh, with the amount of changes that's coming in. So you basically have a scale out solution already done for you that uh, uh, is based on uh, how much data is actually sent to the function. So with that, uh, other couple of things that I guess makes you happy because uh, one of the most common uh, uh, question I have when I present this kind of session is what happens if uh, the connection to the database is lost? Well, inside the code of the Azure uh, SQL trigger, the Azure Function SQL Trigger, there is already all the logic to retry in case of connection error or even exceptions. Of course, at some point we will give up if an exception uh, it's already it's uh, continuously happening. But in general, if you if it's just a matter of uh, uh, temporary disconnection, uh, we will uh, the Azure Function SQL Trigger will take care of that for you. Um, of course, if you want to change the batch size or the number of changes per worker or even the polling interval, because uh, uh, how it works behind the scene is that it, the Azure Function SQL Trigger will check for changes using the change tracking feature every X second. By default, that X is equal to one, but you can actually change that value in order to make it more suitable to your need. Everything is uh, configurable as you can obviously imagine. So let's go to the demo and uh, let me bring up the code. So the code is very easy. I created a function, let me close this. Uh, I created a function using the usual function uh, init uh, process and um, here I have my Azure trigger binding. So as you can see it's just a regular function and it's marked with the attribute function. I'm using the isolated environment and this is the, the magic keyword that makes everything happen, SQL trigger. It's an attribute that you have to specify in your function where basically you define what table you want to monitor and what is the name of the option in the settings that contains the connection string. Uh, we support, of course, all uh, type of authentication, SQL authentication, but also, and that's what I'm going to use, uh, manage the identities and entry the authentication. And then you have another option that you have to specify in your function that is basically the payload, the changes that you will be getting. It's an I-read-only list of SQL change on the object that you have created in order to get 
the information about the changes draw. So sample table, in my case, is a POCO object that, con that contains exactly the uh, attribute with the same name of the column of the table I am monitoring. So you will see that my sample table has exactly these columns. Uh, why some columns need to be uh, nullable, even if you will see in the table are not nullable, because uh, if I delete the column, if I delete the row, uh, what uh, it will happen is that I will only get the information about the primary key, which is in my case is the ID that is, is uh, that has been deleted, uh, and of course I will get null values um, for all the values that uh, uh, are related to a row that has been deleted, because that's exactly what happened. The row has been deleted, so these values are gone. So that's why you need to make sure that everything is nullable here, except for the primary key. And uh, the I read only list uh, has this interesting. Uh, option, um, the SQL changes more specifically, object, uh, the, uh, um, have this interesting operation property that tells you if the operation was an insert, update, or a delete. And then the item itself is basically the POC object you have created that contains the rows that has, uh, the, the payload of the row that has been changed. So it's very, very easy. Um, it's just a few line of code. Uh, and of course, here I'm not doing anything interesting. I'm just logging, but you can imagine that uh, once you get the information about the row that has changed, you can actually do anything. You can send this data to an event tab. You can call a signaler endpoint to update a website. You can do whatever it's needed to do in order to, for example, process an order, validate a user, or whatever. So in this case, I'm just logging, but let me show you how it is, it is to set up. So first of all, we need to set up a database. So let's make sure that database has change tracking, change tracking enabled. That's how I do it, very easy and I'm connecting to my local database. So yes, of course, my change tracking is already enabled. That's fine. I'm now creating a table here. Uh, again, the primary key is my ID, and then uh, some value, another value are exactly the name of the column that I will also be using in the POCO object. And then I enable my table for change tracking. That is something that you have to do in order to have uh, the SQL trigger function working correctly. Once it's enabled, you can even, uh, uh, of course, check in some uh, and this specific uh, uh, system table, if change tracking is enabled or not, has been enabled for me, so all is good. I can just now go here, and since already the code has been written, I can just do func start and see what happens. Now the table is completely empty, so no changes so far, uh, so I don't expect anything to, uh, to happen here, so I don't expect anything to be logged. Of course, I would just expect to see my function uh, ready, and I actually have a couple of functions, the one that we are focusing on right now is this one, the SQL trigger. The other one, the HTTP trigger, will be used later in another day. So let me go <clears throat> back here and uh, now try to do something on my data, but not before having uh, uh, shown you that, uh, let me make some space here, that I'm using this database. And you will see that now, aside of the table I have created, let me zoom in a bit, Inside of the table I've created, we have two other couple of uh, uh, tables that has been created for you when the SQL trigger uh, was started. Uh, basically, the SQL trigger needs to keep track of what rows you have already been notified of changes. So that's how it does it using some uh, uh, additional table that has automatically created uh, when uh, it was started. So don't don't fear if you see this additional stuff, it's needed for the SQL trigger to function properly. Now that I said that, uh, let's just take a look at our table, which is empty. Fantastic. And uh, let me move this on the right side of the screen. And let me move this on the left side of the screen, make some space, and take a look at the uh, log. So let's add a couple of rows in one single transaction. And you will see here that uh, in, uh, oh, sorry, I did it uh, in the Azure database, not the local one. So let me uh, connect and connect to the correct one, actually. So let me go here. Let's do from here new query. We connect to this database and do this one here. Nice. Okay. So this is the empty table on my local database. Yes, now I'm in the local database. Nice. So let's go back here, insert a couple of rows, and you will see that immediately the rows are now have been sent to the function. Again, everything is working locally in the function process of the changes. So as you can see, 
one change, even if affecting more row, send more rows, sent uh, both of the rows affected uh, to the one execution that happened behind the scene. So one execution for a batch of rows. Now, what happens if I just do one transaction with just one option that is actually affecting two rows? Again, it will you will get a couple of execution. That is nice. And of course, if I delete everything, uh, again, you will get both rows sent to your execution. Uh, and you see that the operation changes because two is for deletion, one is for the update, and zero is for insert. Now, let me let me insert again the row. Let's do something interesting here. I'm, in, I'm adding the rows, and basically, without uh, uh, letting any time pass between the addition and the update, I'm also updating the rows. So I'm changing the second value here, the some other column to Davide instead of the original value. So let's see what happened. What you have received here is an insert notification because zero is the insert, but look at the some other value. It's equal to the latest value detected, right? That's because uh, between uh, when we did the insert and the update, uh, the function didn't had a chance to be executed because we did it very quickly. And so that's exactly what happened. The function in the change tracking uh, allows us to get access to the rows changed into the latest version of the data, not the intermediate one. So here we are notified that uh, a new row has been added, uh, but with the latest data, which is exactly what you need because uh, uh, in this kind of scenario, you probably don't need to have the intermediate changes. You only need to understand if data has changed and then get the latest version of the change in order to act upon that change. Uh, there are other ways to um, to uh, monitor uh, the full history of changes, and uh, and then we can discuss it later. Uh, but for this one, you will always get access to the latest changes. Okay. Now, what happens if I want to deploy everything in Azure? That is very easy. Let me uh, stop this. Of course, you can do using AZD, as you have seen in a previous session, or Pycept, or even from uh, uh, Visual Studio, I just uh, installed the Azure function extension. I can deploy to a function app. Very, very easy. And what, 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 what will happen is that I get uh, this function here that shows me that I have the trigger SQL and the HTTP uh, trigger available. Now, if I go and take a look at the, the um, application insights, and let me clean everything here, you will see that every time, since this is now working on, uh, on Azure SQL and on Azure, you will see now that I have to change to my Azure database. So let me make sure I connect it to the Azure database. Okay, this is my Azure database. And here I did exactly the same as I did uh, on premises with one big difference. I, and this is something I really want to show you. I am connecting using, of course, a connection string that I can easily share with you because there is nothing secret in here, right? Because I'm using the Active Directory authentication. So in order to do that, what I had to do is, of course, make sure that my function has uh, an identity enabled. So in this case, I'm using a system assigned identity. And the system assigned identity created as the same name of the function app. So I took this value here. And you will see that uh, in uh, the sample I provide to you, you also have uh, something that you need for Azure when you deploy on Azure. You need to create a user that represents the function. So again, I'm using exactly the same uh, name of the function because when I created my identity it was given the same name of the function and then uh, since my um, my code needs to read from in this case any table to write to my table and to create uh, the additional table I shown before I'm, I'm giving the right permission and I'm also granting the ability to view the change tracking on the table I have um, I, I want to enable for change track. That's it. So just make sure that um, you use, um, that's my recommendation. Of course, you can still use SQL auth, but we are really, really uh, kind of uh, 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 telling you that the best way to do that, uh, uh, to do security is without using password. So just use the identity. And then that's very easy. I can go to the environment variables, wherever my connection string uh, stored. And again, I can go here and show it to, it to you because uh, again, there is nothing secret in it, right? So that's, that's 
that make my life as a developer super easy. I don't have to think about uh, password and logins anymore. And, uh, and once that is done, everything is working nicely. So my trigger is available here, as I already shown. So let's go here and see what happens. Let me show you what happens if I, this, I'm connected to Azure, yes. So let me delete everything from my table and, and insert. Um, now my table is empty. Let me insert again a couple of rows here. If I go back here, you will see that the function has been executed once when I deleted my row and another one time when I have uh, um, inserted a new row. And this is just like magic because, again, I, let me do one other, one other, couple of other, and you will see that the function is just uh, being executed any time I insert a row or delete a row or uh, do any operation that changes the data on my table. So this really enables you to create uh, event-driven architectures using Azure SQL or SQL Server as a producer in this case, which is amazing because again, completely changes the way you think about your database if you if you start to think uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of approach. Now, one last thing I want to show you before going to take any question is that uh, this approach is great, but what happens if you don't have a table that you want to monitor? Because maybe you, you want to execute the function based on something that happened in a storage procedure or some more deterministic way, but that is not related to data being changed in a table. For example, you would love to be able to call a function as a part of a storage procedure execution, maybe to process some data before making the changes or to notify or call other services, or even to send a, some, some log to a remote information to a remote service to track that the function has been that the storage procedure has been executed. So to do that, you can use a new storage procedure call, well, relatively new, uh, in the sense that it's been around for a year now, uh, SP Invoke External REST Endpoint that allows you to call any REST endpoint that you have in Azure or even outside Azure using API management or some tunneling te technique. Uh, it's available in Azure SQL already in GA and has been just recently released in preview in SQL MI, if you are using that uh, version of Azure SQL, so that you can call any function, any REST endpoint, any event tab. You can send a message uh, to uh, event tab, you can uh, interact with Azure storage, uh, you can use OpenAI to get embeddings, for example, from a text. So it really allows you to call any REST endpoint published by Azure and even by other services. It's very easy to be called, as you can see, exec uh, SP invoke external REST endpoint, uh, and, uh, and then it supports JSON, XML, plain text payload, anything. It typically comes in and out from a REST endpoint. Of course, it supports also managed entities, but if you have a function that requires a specific header uh, with some secrets, uh, you can actually uh, even provide that. Uh, and you don't even need to store it in clear text in the function call, but you can use scope database credential to make sure that everything is securely stored uh, and uh, only those people with the right permission can actually access it. Uh, it, it has been built. We really put a lot of effort in making sure that uh, the, all the access to a uh, REST endpoint is absolutely secure. So, for example, we only support HTTPS protocol. We don't follow uh, redirects. Uh, um, and uh, we also have some throttling uh, already embedded in the logic of the calls, uh, just to make sure that uh, noisy neighbor problems cannot happen. With that, let me show that in action is actually very, very easy. I just, uh, it's just one line of code. So let me copy and paste this from here. And I just need to make sure that I'll be on Azure. So here I'm actually calling the HTTP. I have deployed as part of my example. So here I have an HTTP trigger. And the HTTP trigger is just, you know, take first name, last name, and say hello world to the first name. So what I have to do is, call the REST endpoint, specify what method I want to use, specify the content type, then the payload is actually my, uh, in this case, JSON object, and the response would be giving me as an output parameter. So let me run this in a sec in millisecond. I got the full response. So the full response contain all the metadata, even the headers that I've received from the server, and of course, the payload. Uh, the code is payload is super easy, thanks to the JSON function you now have in Azure SQL, so I can just do JSON value and then extract the message, and here it is. So if I need to call a function in a way that is not related to some data changed in a table, but 
again, part of a story procedure, part of a script, uh, SPVOC extend rest endpoint is the way to do it uh, today. With that, let me go to my last slide and one practical example of putting all of these things together. So the event uh, monitoring uh, on the table using the function, the calling to open AI rest point to get embeddings in the specific case. Uh, it's built end to end using also Data API Builder and other service I love that allows you to take your database and turn it into a GraphQL rest endpoint. So basically doing the opposite of what we are, uh, what I've been explained so far and creating an end-to-end -end full stack jump stack application that allows you to chat with your own data well that's the example you want to uh, go and follow azure sql azure sql db session recommender v2 that basically wraps everything i just described uh, into an end-to-end -end solution adding you know the ai spice on it which is uh, today all the rage so make sure to, to to check this out it's very very interesting and uh, for example this website is what i'm using it even today at uh, VS Live, where I am right now, to explain AI uh, in end to end solution with uh, Azure SQL function and GraphQL. Uh, this is a broader uh, solution that you can create with Azure SQL and, for example, function integration, data API builder, everything. This is a very modern architecture based on events. Uh, and of course, this is a little bit more complicated than the one what I shown before, as is it's showing everything, including the analytical part telemetry and logging and everything, but this is something you can easily build using SQL as an um, event receiver or even an event producer today. A couple of resources here, make sure to check out Azure SQL.dev. I have wrote a book years ago and also Bob Ward that is here with me today also wrote a nice book called Azure SQL Build. Make sure also to check out the AI resources. It's, again, the AI is the hot topic uh, to understand how you can integrate everything I've shown with uh, um, your AI ideas. And last but not least, and then I have a couple of minutes for questions, is make sure that you go to this uh, list, to this URL, and or use this QR code to fill out uh, this survey, because this allows you to tell us what you want in Azure SQL. Three years ago, we did the same, the same survey, and we got a huge amount of feedback uh, on need to support Azure function, need to be able to call REST endpoint, need to be able to expose a table as a GraphQL endpoint. And we, we built all of that in the last three years. So now that we have built, uh, I would say, 90% of what we have been asked, uh, it's now ready to for you to ask for, for more. So what you want to have in Azure SQL Next, where do you think we should work on? So make sure to fill this out. It's very important for us because it allows us to correctly prioritize the development of the product to make sure that this uh, is matching uh, your need as a developer. And uh, with that, I am uh, done uh, on time, I think. So let me go and, uh, and see if there are any questions uh, uh, for me. Let me just go back here and stop sharing my screen and here we go okay so david you mentioned timeout connection issue and what happens if there is a larger issue and the process timeouts so there is a way to re-trigger things um not uh so if the row has is been determined to be completely lost because again maybe there are uh, exception in the last 30 minutes something like that uh, no in that case you have to you have to retry it uh, manually. So you, one one technique I use is, is that I add a column to my table that uh, basically forces uh, the row to be reprocessed. Uh, that's an option that you have. And actually, this exactly technique is also shown in the end-to-end -end sample I mentioned before. Um, Yes, so does the trigger work in a .NET isolated pro process? Absolutely, yes. That's exactly what I used in my sample that I will soon publish also on GitHub. So absolutely, yes, it's, it, it's working perfectly, actually. That's the, the way you should be start using Azure Function right now, using isolated process. And um, is the change tracking available on Prem SQL Server? Absolutely, yes. Uh, you can implement Azure Function Trigger without mu moving the database to the cloud. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so Azure, um, the change tracking is available everywhere. Uh, there is, just for you to know, there is even a more powerful version of change tracking called Change Data Capture that is also available on SQL Server and uh, on, uh, on Azure SQL that allows you to even track and, and keep uh, uh, um, kind of a... Um, 
breadcrumb of all the changes that happen between when your function executed once and when your uh, function executed next. So you don't just have uh, the net changes, but you have all the historical changes happened on the row if that's what you need. And that, uh, and that is also available on SQL Server and in Azure SQL. Okay, so uh, it seems that I am perfectly at time. Thanks a lot for the question. Thanks a lot of Haley for having me. Thank uh, you so much for joining. Yeah, we'll let it. you get back to your, to your conference. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> usually we can see you on the Data API Builder live streams. That's right, streams. Uh, that's there, right. There's that's one right. tomorrow. Yeah, I will um, skip that, I'm but Jerry will... Yeah, Jerry will yep. be there. I know that Jerry also has a session on Data API Builder uh, with Frank uh, at this conference. So make sure that you you tune for tune in for that because it's going to be amazing. Oh yeah. So stay <laughs> tuned later today. Thank you so much, Dr. Right. Day. Have a great day. Bye bye.